over the past three weeks, we've heard the government and the opposition go back and forth over Jamaica's $1.3 trillion budget. A lot of good points were made on both sides, but we, the public, still have some questions. So joining me now to discuss the 2024-25 national budget is Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Khalila. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be with you. Glad to have you as well. You must be tired because it's been a marathon day and few weeks. Yes, it, it always is. Um, you know, you have to prepare the budget presentation. And then, you know, the finance minister is the only person who speaks twice. I have to speak again. And uh, in speaking again, I have to, you know, summarize, but at the same time, respond to comments, claims, suggestions that have been made. So it is definitely it takes a toll. How do you do it? Because I was thinking, you guys speak for, you spoke for four and a half hours the first time. The PM spoke for five hours. I know when I give presentations, my voice goes out after two hours. And you maintain the energy, like how? You know, if I think about it, it's, it's, it's I can't explain it myself. Um, if I really kind of, kind of think about it. But, you know, it's just passion. Um, I'm very passionate about Jamaica. I've always been from a been a child, and I believe fervently that Jamaica is a country of destiny, and we have been underperforming for you know 50 years, all of my lifetime. And I'm just uh, passionate about the opportunity uh, to you know take our country forward in a in a in a direction, or or help to take our country forward uh, in a way that we haven't had the opportunity before. So it's that passion that keeps me going. And, you know, we're getting results at the same time. And so, you know, the, the results uh, uh, are self-reinforcing, if you understand what I mean. They right. propel you forward. So, you know, it's like you're prepared to, uh, you know, take the, the obstacle course, the energy that's required, the, you know, the beat up, the criticism sometimes unfairly, uh, because you are convinced that, you know, you're doing something and making a contribution that needs to be made. Mm -hmm. So I sure have some questions for you, but tonight I really want it to be about the viewers and hearing feedback from the public. What questions do you guys, our viewers, still have for Minister Clark, having heard his opening debate, his closing debate, and all the debates in between the PM, the opposition leader, the finance spokesperson on opposition. Put your comments in the chat. We'd love to hear what your questions are. But uh, while they get theirs together, I'm going to start the ball rolling. One of my questions, Dr. Clark, was on the issue of the securitization of receivables. Because everybody always asks, OK, you're going to do all this stuff. How are you going to pay for it? You made this announcement that there's going to be what we call securitization of receivables. Basically, the government is selling uh, $45 billion of receivables in order to offset expenses in the budget. But then the opposition leader pointed out that you said it was uh, market sensitive, so you couldn't reveal what it was. What can you tell us at this point? Well, so, uh, Kalila, there is nothing abnormal about that. The budget consists of $300 billion of market financing, right? Of loan financing. We are not required, nor do we specify exactly how we're going to do that because that would be market sensitive information. So we don't come out and say, we're going to issue a bond of 10 years duration on, in June, or nor do we say we're going to issue a J dollar instrument internationally or issue a J dollars of this. No, uh, we just, put forward that we're going to finance the budget by raising, I'm sorry, the, the number this year is $200 billion in new financing. We are paying off $300 billion of maturing debt, and we are uh, engaged in borrowing of $200 billion of new debt. So we don't provide you know, uh, particulars on that because to provide particulars on the debt that we'll be issuing uh, would influence what is possible. And we don't want to do that. That's not in the public's interest. And similarly, uh, what I described as the sale of receivables is non-recourse financing, meaning that it's financing that uh, the government of Jamaica, it's not debt, the government of Jamaica doesn't have to pay it back. Um, uh, but to say any more at this point 
could jeopardize the transaction. So it's not in the public interest to do so. At the right time, uh, I will provide complete details. And I'll be back on your program, uh, if you invite me, uh, to provide details on that transaction. But to do so uh, in advance would be to put the transaction at risk. And nobody wants that to happen. So that means that it hasn't been so you don't have a buyer yet. It's just a plan to sell the receivables at this point. No, we have, you know, we have, we have market testing and we have, uh, you know, so let, let, I don't want to say too much on it, uh, Kalila. Let me, at the, at the right time, which, you know, hopefully won't be, we have 12 months, right? But at the right time, which hopefully won't be too long, uh, you know, I'll be back on your program. And like I always do, I'll provide all the information uh, at a time that I'm able to do it. I'm just not able to do it now because it would affect the very transaction that we want to see happen. And again, I gave you the parallel with uh, loan financing that we have put out that we are going to be borrowing $200 billion of, uh, of, of, sorry, issuing $200 billion of new debt this year uh, and paying off $300 billion of maturing debt. But we are not providing any particulars uh, about the tenure of that debt, the rates that we are going to be seeking, the currencies, when we're going to do it or anything like that, because that would uh, undermine the very transactions. So what I, my posture here is very consistent. And I know that you want to know more, but I, I, I commit to you that once you make the invitation, I'll be back on your program to discuss that transaction when I'm in a position to do so. Well, I'll definitely be making that invitation. I see some questions starting to come in from the audience. So let's take the first one from our from our audience. Javon wants you to shed some light on the unemployment. Well, he has two questions and it's two long questions. Unemployment insurance, tax credit. Uh, let's take them one at a time. So yeah, unemployment I you, insurance. Lita, I, am, I, am, I am inspired by the interest in unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, it's nice to work on a a, a juicy piece of policy and to find that the public is interested in that policy. Uh, unemployment insurance, I don't know what direction the, the questioner wants me to go, but let me just say that unemployment insurance has been a reality for other Caribbean countries for decades, Bahamas and Barbados. Uh, Jamaica started the national insurance scheme in the 1960s. And in that debate, when you look at it, the intention was to you know, do unemployment insurance next, but history uh, took over, so to speak. The unemployment insurance scheme will is a contributory scheme uh, at, in, in the worst case and will provide an unemployment benefit that is linked to the person's prior earnings. So the, I give an example of Barbados and Bahamas to make the point. In Barbados, a person who is newly unemployed uh, will receive 60% of their previous weekly earnings for 26 weeks, that is six months. In Bahamas, the person who is newly unemployed will receive 50% of their previous weekly earnings for 13 weeks, which is three months. Jamaica will have to choose the parameters that make sense for us. The cost from our feasibility study is about 0.8% to 1.5% of payroll if we simply slap it on as an additional deduction. We would ideally not like to do that, what we'd prefer to do is to consolidate existing deductions into a single social statutory tax or whatever you know we decide to call it. And then the funds would be remitted by legislation to the respective agencies, NHT, NIS, HART, et cetera. And if we you do know, it I saw, that I saw way, some people, I saw some people commenting on, on that point where, where you said that you want to consolidate all the deductions into one deduction. Some people were saying that's how you hide things. They, they want to be able to see exactly where their money is going. Well, there, there are two sides to the story. The, the first side is that it introduces a lot of complexity. We have four deductions already. To add a fifth one uh, would mean that, especially for small businesses, uh, for your business, Kalila, I mean, for you know, businesses that employ fewer than 20 people or fewer than 10 people, it just the complexity is just not worth it. And what you'll find is that people with additional of another statutory reduction, you know, in the incentive for informality will grow. So by legislation, it would be clear that a certain amount must go to, to the respective entities that you know law has to be observed. Um, and uh, what if we do it that way, the advantages that 
by removing sort of thresholds and, and streamlining, we, we could be in a position to introduce unemployment insurance in a way that, you know, for 90 to 95% of persons, it's not an additional, you know, there's no more to be deducted. And that's what you call efficiency and productivity. One of the things, you know, clearly that people don't sort of fully recognize up front is that for the four different statutory deductions that we have, we have completely different regimes for each of them. You know, uh, they differ in uh, the segment of employment income that is open to taxation, right, or open to deduction. Some of them have exemptions before you can deduct. Then they have different thresholds. So you need a computer program, literally, to work Tell out me about it. Things today. Tell me about it. Today, today is the 26th. It so yesterday I, had payroll, yesterday I had payroll to do. And I, for the first time, I had to do it myself. Yes. I was there trying to figure I literally have the tab open here trying to figure out, okay, so education is 3% for employer and two for no, 2.25 employee. And then this one is that. And they're all different. It is not, different, not only the rates are different, but the threshold uh, that it applies to, they differ from each of them, right? Some of them are up to this amount. Some of them are up to that amount. And some of them exempt certain income from, tech, from the deduction. So literally, to do it properly, you need a computer program. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so what we want to do is to simplify the system. And that we, we have found that when you simplify the system, formality improves. When we got rid of the minimum business tax and the asset tax for non-financial businesses, company registrations went through the roof and they continue to set new records. So it's from that experience that what we want to do ideally is to consolidate the social taxes. One tax, you have income tax above the threshold of 25% and you have another one above another threshold at 30% and then you have one statutory reduction of X percent. Simple. That will make that will put small business or micro business on even playing field with large businesses. For large businesses, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't make a difference because they have the people, they have the administration, they have the staff, they have the, they have the enterprise systems. They can afford SAP and all these complicated systems. They can deal with the complexity. But if we want Jamaica to grow and prosper, we need it to be easy for micro businesses to simply to, to be compliant. Uh, and that is the that would be the motivation behind that. But it's very, very challenging to achieve. I don't want to yeah. underestimate it or to say it's easy to achieve that goal of a, you know, as I said, you know, it's not a new idea. <laughs> that idea has been around for some time and uh, it has been pursued by others and it has not yet been achieved. Uh, I think employers will support you on that. I don't know about employees, which is the majority of the population, whether they will go for it. But we'll see. Uh, it just takes public what, you know, What's in it for employees is that you can get another, for most employees, right, for 95% of employees, you can get another benefit without paying any more. How about that? But to get it, we're going to have to consolidate. If you want to pay more, we can keep it separate, have five separate deductions. Yeah, but you're going to pay more. Okay. Next, the next thing that has received a lot of attention is this reverse tax credit. So Sean says, Mr. Clark, can you please explain how the reverse tax credit will work and how can someone apply for it? Will there be a campaign to educate Jamaicans on how to get it? Right. Thank you for that question. Let me ask the last one, last question first. Absolutely. There will be a campaign to a public education campaign to explain how it works, how to get it what to do if you have problems. And we will not roll it out until that public education campaign has had the chance uh, for for majority of Jamaicans who are uh, in the target group to see or to participate in the public education. The reverse income tax credit is a very simple proposition. We propose that every individual who earns under $3 million or $3 million and under in the 2023 year, uh, who is also filing or paying or having deducted from their salaries contributions to NHT, to NIS, and to EdTax, that those persons will receive on application a grant of $20,000 from the government of Jamaica. It's a revolutionary concept in that it is providing 
a benefit in uh, uh, to to persons, uh, you know, who there's no rhyme or reason, right? And what it aims to do, it recognizes the distribution of income in society, and it's sending a signal, right? This policy sends a signal that this is something. It's important to us that those at the bottom of the ladder who are contributing to the system, who have NHT, NIS, and ed tax deducted from their pay, that we hear you, we see you, and we understand that times are challenging. And here is a grant from the government of Jamaica. There's a concept, you know, reverse income tax credits are not new. They exist in other countries. And we will be doing this on a one-off basis uh, this year uh, to provide, you know, a, a modest amount of relief to Jamaicans. And you have to remember that we have 570,000 Jamaicans who earn below the income tax threshold and 450,000, I'm sorry, who earn 570,000 who earn less than 3 million and 450,000 whose Incomes, as declared to the Tax Administration Jamaica, is less than $1.5 million. And it includes hundreds of thousands of persons at minimum wage or just above minimum wage for whom a $20,000 check, no question asked, or $20,000 cash, no questions asked, will be quite meaningful. So I heard the opposition's take on the reverse tax credit, part of it being that, well, everybody should get it. Meaning, because the conditionality surrounding your ab uh, ability to qualify for the reverse tax credit is that your taxes for 2023 are paid up. But what about those people whose employer didn't pay over their taxes? And I heard your response today as well, saying, oh, well, those people, they're already getting more because their employer isn't paying the taxes. But that doesn't apply to everyone, Minister Clark, because there are employers who deduct the taxes from your salary, but don't pay it over to TAJ. So you get a pay slip saying that the taxes are, are have been taken out, but it hasn't been paid over. So those employees are not receiving more than other employees in similar roles. All right. So so, Camino, uh, Kalila, one thing in policy making is that the exceptions don't make the rule. Okay, exceptions don't make the rule. I don't know that that's the that's the. Well, let's I, separate. Would, I don't know if I would qualify that as an exception because there are a lot, a lot of people no, no, who fall in that basket. It all it's all relative to numbers. So, so let's separate uh, working Jamaicans into two brackets. One bracket consists of persons who are from whom statutory deductions are taken from their salary or who voluntarily because they're self-employed they remit statutory deductions to, to to the to the tax agencies these are people from whom two percent has been deducted from nht two percent has been deducted from nis and three percent has been deducted from sorry two percent from nht 2% from education tax and 3% from NIS. That's 7% that is leaving their salaries. What we're saying is that for people from whom 7% is leaving their salaries for their own benefit, right? Because NIS is a benefit, NHG is a benefit, but nonetheless is leaving their salaries. We are saying, look, we're going to give you a cash grant of $20,000. Now, as compared to the other bracket, a, a huge bracket of persons who are earning income, but who are not having 7% deducted from their salaries, it's only fair that if we're given a $20,000 grant, it goes to the persons from whom 7% has been deducted. The $20,000 is far less than the 7%, far less. So for those from who, for who are not contributing and for whom, from whom the deductions are not being made, they're better off anyway. Yeah, they have more of their income that they keep. So I'm, we I'm, are... I'm, not, I'm not following you on this point because I thought the deduction was made. I thought I was paying over these taxes. 
because my employer took it from my salary, but they never paid it over to right. me. So, so, it's so, not my fault that I am not up to date on my taxes because the understood. employer is supposed to be making that payment on my behalf. Understood. Understood. I'm getting there. I'm dealing with a large group of taxpayers first, right? The large groups consist of those who are in the system and contributing, right? hundreds of thousands, almost 600,000 people in that bracket. And then there are hundreds of thousands of people who are not contributing and making a distinction between those two groups and saying that one of those groups is 7% better off. And I'm justifying that the group that is 7% worse off because they're compliant, they are deserving of the helping hand from the government. Now, there is, in the context of the employed labor force, there is a small number, I'm not saying it's small absolute, but it's small relative to the number of employed. There is a group of persons who are working for employers who are being fraudulent. There's no other way to describe it. They're being fraudulent. They're deducting from their employees and not paying it over. The remedy there, Kalila, is for them to be reported and taken to court and for penalties to be applied and for them to be forced by the court to pay over the funds. That is the recourse for that group of, of employers uh, who, as you point out, have a del deleterious effect on their employees. Forget the reverse income tax credit, Kalila. Think about their qualification for NHT. Think about their qualification for NIS. Mm -hmm. You're talking about which is, which is why I brought it up because we always hear these stories about people so, saying I went to NHT to apply for my benefit, and at that point yeah, I found so out the, my employer never paid yeah, it. So the, the key, it's much bigger than a reverse income tax credit. Twenty thousand dollars is nothing compared to the opportunity to get a pension from NIS or to get a grant from the NHT. So we have a much bigger problem here, and the remedy for that problem is for employees when they become aware to report those employers to the authorities, yeah? They're, once those employers are reported to the authorities, action can be taken and those employers can be held to account. But you also have employers who have filed and they're just late. And they are incurring penalties and interests, but, you know... It is what it is sometimes, you know, you're, you're late with the yes, team. I, I would say, but I mean, based on the data uh, that we have, uh, Kalila, uh, the, the persons who fall into that, those categories are the very, very small minority compared with the number who are in. Um, uh, you know, that, that's just a, a fact. And, you know, in making policy, as I said, we can't dwell on the exceptions. And by exceptions, I mean people who fall outside of the norm, especially when those are you know in the minority i'm not here including as a minority the large group of people who are decidedly in the informal system right i've already conceded there's a large group and that change in that will take time and but those people are better off by seven percent so i'm not worried about those for the people that you're talking about people who are late in filing well look you know we live in a, a country of rules and laws and you know we are uh the the you know you gotta be you gotta be on time. There are nearly six hundred thousand persons who are on time, and you know they they deserve uh, to to get the benefit. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a lot of comments on that one. Kevin says it's your fault. You should follow up with your employer to make sure that your tax is properly submitted. And I think this initiative is gonna compel many employees to when they apply, they're gonna find out, and so it's probably going to improve yes. compliance em in that employees regard. Employees badgering their employers is the best way to get this resolved. And look, the government wants the number of persons on the statutory you know, deduction rolls to increase because these are statutory, statutory deductions are, you know, are not taxes, they're benefits, right? Well, certainly for NIS and NHT, uh, you get a benefit or there's a benefit that is you know, available. So and is a part of our social security system. So we want more persons who are employ, employed to be in the position where they're making their deductions. And you know what, Kalila, with the approach that we have taken, we have seen a gradual increase in formalization. I don't have the exact numbers here, but I do know that at least, at, certainly at the beginning of the administration, the number of persons you know, in the formal system were in a region of 500,000 plus, 
right? Five, I don't know, 500,000, 520,000, 530,000, somewhere in that region. And today, the number of people in the formal system is 640,000. And I believe that if we continue with this kind of approach over time, you're going to see that number, you know, going up. And if we make the process more simple, part of the problem, the structural problem that keeps people out is that it is too difficult to calculate and pay four separate deductions calculated very, very differently on different bases with different thresholds uh, to you know, at the same time, right, to four different agencies. That is what is keeping people out of the formal system. And we, it is incumbent upon us to solve that structural challenge by allowing people just to pay one time, one amount. It becomes very, very simple. Yeah, another major point from the presentation was about the removal of GCT from imported raw food stuff. We've heard a lot of discussion about that over the past couple of weeks. We have a question here. This person says he's a farmer. The GCT that we pay on farm product is killing us. Why not remove GCT off all farm products? Right. So taxes like GCT, which are value-added taxes, right, which um, you are, are, are not net taxes, right? The net tax is the difference between your input VA, your input GCT and your output GCT. The country works best when GCT is basically applied everywhere, yeah? And we don't have so many exemptions. Jamaica went through a tough time fiscally and we uh, lost a lot. Um, and one of the reforms that we had to do to get back to where we were was to broaden the, the GCT net. Uh, now that Jamaica is doing a little better, reversing that would be um, a sure sign that, you know, yeah, that, that's just problematic, right? Because there's no stopping. You know, there's every, you know, a lot of organized interest groups would want GCT removed from their favorite thing. Believe me, I, as Minister of Finance and Public Service, I get suggestions like the one that you've mentioned multiple times from multiple groups. And once you start taking GCT off, you're going to be rolling it off of everything. Yeah. And the revenues are going to be cannibalized and eroded. And before you know it, you know, we're running massive deficits on the basis of consumption, running up our debt again. So it's just not sustainable to do that. The, on GCT on raw foods, you know, it's it's very, very unfortunate. And, you know, I, I, the, the fact that it falls to me to do it, I I, I regret. I, I, I wish it weren't the case. But it's a very, it's a simple matter from the point of view of what needs to happen. Article 3 of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, GATT, is explicitly clear that internal taxes like GCT cannot be applied on goods coming into the country if they're not applied on those goods originating in that country. It's crystal clear. In 2012, the government needed to raise revenues and they delivered a tax package of $19 billion in June of 2012, which annualized was $23 billion or 1.8% of GDP. In that tax package was a broadening of the GCT net to levy GCT on raw foods, on all raw foods, imported and domestic. On, from 1991 up until that time, there was no GCT on raw foods, whether domestic or imported. So 2012, they make, an, they're in a parliamentary speech, GCT is going on all raw foods, imported and domestic. There's a backlash and the government removes GCT from domestic raw foods. Yeah? Not for protection, but for, they can't afford to give up all of it, so they give up the domestic side. And play a game of what we call catch me if you can. Right? It was a violation then, but... Who's going to catch me, so to speak? Yeah. CARICOM wrote in 2014 and said, wait a minute, what you're doing here, I'm going to say wrote, they contacted the government. What you're doing here breaks international trade rules 
and uh, you're not allowed to do it. So what you know what the government did in 2014? They had to put to remove the GCT from foreign goods that originate in CARICOM. Fast forward, so catch me if you can, the government was caught. Fast forward to 2023, the WTO visits Jamaica and they make, this is obviously long after 2012, everybody's forgotten about it. They visit Jamaica and they make the observation that Jamaica is violating, breaching a sacrosanct principle that Jamaica is committed to. I mean, it's a bright line, black and white issue. You're not allowed to charge GCT differentially. You can charge duty. You can charge additional stamp duty, but you're not allowed to charge GCT on foreign goods and not charge them on the same goods produced locally. So when the WTA, what, what's our obligation? I mean, we are a law-abiding country. We are a country that a lot of people stand up and say you must abide by international treaties. You must obey international law. This is not a negotiable aspect this, of the WTO arrangements. This is in the foundation principles. So we have no choice in a matter, Kalila. Either we put GCT on locally produced raw foods or we take GCT off of foreign imported raw foods. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, you know, that the protection mechanisms are in the duties and additional stamp duties. Right. And I was just going to ask you about that because I heard you saying today that we could make up for it by increasing stamp duty, uh, customs duties. Yes. Yeah. But so, that so, takes some time because it's a lot of paperwork. Yes. Really. The first thing to acknowledge is that I've made an announcement of the change in the GCT regime. I've not brought the bill to Parliament yet. I've not passed the amendment. We can determine the time, the exact time in which it's done, but it has to be done. Yeah. And what I was saying today is that certainly for goods like tomato, for cabbage, for carrot, we have duties of 100% and we have additional stamp duty of 80%. Now, the way those work, Kalila, and for your viewers, is that they are cumulative, they are compounded. So something costs a dollar or let's say something costs $10, the duty is 100%, yeah? So that's the, the good now costs $10 plus $10, $20. And then you apply the 80%, which is 16. So you go to 36. So it goes from 10 to 36, 260% protection for tomatoes, for cabbage, and for carrots. And there are other duty amounts and additional stamp duty for other items. And what I said today is that we'll convene the required stakeholder group to look at additional stamp duty, to look at uh, and decide what we are going to do. One thing to realize, though, is that there's a maximum that we can apply. And a maximum in Jamaica for a lot of goods is 80% additional stamp duty. And how the WTO works and anybody can check this for themselves, right? There's a schedule of maximum additional duties that Jamaica, that's a part of our agreement with the WTO. And we can't go above those maximum, right? And to change those maximum would be a negotiating process. And Article 28, in my presentation, I erroneously said 23, but Article 28 of, uh, of, of GATT, um, uh, of the uh, lays out, or sorry, it might be the WTO, check my speech, but it's Article 28, provides the mechanism through which negotiation happens. And it, I have the, I have a I have a flow chart of it. It make your head hurt. It's a process that will take for a small country like Jamaica, <laughs> we take years and lots of money with high priced lawyers. But what is more important is that Article 28 sets out that when you commit a negotiating process to change anything you've committed to. Be prepared to give something up. That's in the article of negotiation. Yeah, you're gonna have to give something up. So, you know, but before we even get there, Kalila, as I said, the maximum of 80%, there are a lot of goods that we are below 80% on. And uh, we'll have that stakeholder group and we'll make a decision on what to do. Obviously, there are multiple considerations. One consideration is the price of food in Jamaica, right? And why should, you know, 
things that are good for you uh, cost so much, right? So we have to bear all perspectives uh, in mind, and that multi-stakeholder group will make proposals that uh, I can consider. And what we'll do is try to, to time those. It may not be possible to time them exactly, but certainly that is the, the policy intent. Going back to the reverse tax credit, we have a question from Dr. Scar who wants to know, can pensioners apply for that? Absolutely. Anybody with income less than $3 million for the year. Oren wants to know, will the unemployment insurance be a mandatory deduction from the employee or will it be paid solely by the employer? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's fair that it would be split, right? That um, I said it would cost 0.8 to 1.5 and it needs to be split between employee and employee. Um, you know, both would be vested. But uh, as I said, Khalila, and just to remind the person who asked that question, our goal, if, we, if we're successful, is to consolidate the social statutory deductions um, and therefore, the headline rate doesn't change for the vast majority of people. If we are not able to do that, then it would be an additional charge to employ an employee. But it would be you know, obviously a contribution. I mean, it would be, you know, it's a benefit, right? It's a benefit if you uh, are somehow made, you know, employ unemployed. Sean says, are you concerned about the effects the increase in minimum wage and tax threshold will have on inflation? That's a very good question. And those are the kind of the debates that, you know, I, I like to have. Um, we have seen that prior rounds of adjustment to the minimum wage have had minimal uh, impact on inflation for, for a variety of reasons. Now, that's not to say that you can continue to increase the minimum, the minimum wage and it not affect inflation. There comes a point where it could have uh, an impact. I don't know that we're there yet um, just because of, you know, adding uh, sort of $2,000 a week more, uh, the purchasing power. Yeah, I, I, I just don't, I don't, the analysis shows, Kalila, certainly the analysis for the previous round um, shows that the impact on inflation compared to other factors uh, is minimal. Yeah. But, you know, as we get closer to the target range, any little deviation hurts, right? When you're at 7%, you know, if you say something is going to have a 0.2% impact, not a big deal. But if you're at 6%, a 0.2% impact makes all the difference between being inside the target range and out. So I say it with that advisement. So I, 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 I don't have the, the, the precise number on me here, but uh, I, my uh, view is that the impact is, is um, it, there will be an impact. There will be an impact, but I don't know that the impact will be a major impact. Follow up to that comes from Iron Lady. Mr. Clark, on what economic principle did you base the Jamaica minimum wage increase peg on? Was it Jamaica's inflation or just a number? Oh, good question. So, uh, Kalila, the, 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 the minimum wage was $13,000, and it was increased to $15,000, which is an increase of 15%. One of the considerations that drove that change was the policy commitment that at some point in the future to harmonize the minimum wage rates for security guards and for non-security guards. You are aware that up until today, we have had differential minimum wage rates for security guards as opposed to people who are not security guards. And that has been because we had this uh, arrangement where most security guards were hired on contract, yeah? And I was chairman of the NHT, and with the prime minister's support, I approved of the NHT taking the matter of security guards as contract employees to court. Previous governments did not allow those court actions to go through. That is a fact that can be substantiated with documentation. Uh, 
we, sorry, with the support of the prime minister as chairman of the NHT, you know, I supported that court case and the court ruled that security guards ought to be employees. Now, once you make security guards employees, there's no need for a differential in the minimum wage rate for uh, security guards and for uh, for persons who are not security guards. Let me just, just say something differently. For prior administrations, what I, or over prior periods, what I do know is that the NHT was certainly not encouraged to pursue the court cases. When I say with documentation, that's what I mean. That uh, verbal um, evidence exists that you know just didn't support it or thought it was an inopportune time. Uh, we allowed it to go through. So um, with with uh, what I so the policy commitment that was at some point in the future we're going to harmonize the tax rates for security guards and for persons who are not security guards. And given that for the first time, when we're setting a new minimum wage, security guards are now seen as employees, it made sense for this to be the time for that harmonization to happen. But we wanted to give security guards an increase, right? They were at 14,000, other minimum wage earners were at 13,000. So the natural position in terms of a you know, whole, whole number was to land at 15,000. I hope that's a bit of a long answer, but I hope you understand. So. To say it quickly, the situation before, we had 13,000 for minimum wage earners who are not security guards, 14,000 for security guards. We wanted to harmonize it, the next whole number. But we also, not only harmonize it, we want to give security guards an increase as well. Harmonizing at 14,000 would mean security guards would not have gotten an increase. The next whole number is 15,000. We'll move everything up to 15,000. Obviously, we checked the increase, made sure it was higher than inflation. That box was ticked as well, and so settled on that number. You know, I always wondered why there were two different rates for security guards versus everybody else for minimum wage. So thanks for clarifying why that is and why yeah, they are not. Well, the security guards were treated as contract employees and therefore, um, you know, didn't get certain benefits, right? Didn't get holiday, you know, certain benefits. So we had to factor that into the rate to make sure that when you factor in those things, they ended up at the same number, right? They weren't entitled to you know, the same benefits. Uh, I think some of them are holiday and others. So this was a fix that Jamaica came up with to have this differential rate in minimum wage or differential levels in minimum wage rates. Before you go, Minister, I want to ask you about something that was my major gripe with the presentations from both yourself and the Prime Minister. I didn't hear much for entrepreneurs and the business community in general. I'm talking things like tax incentives, grants, access to capital. When you are dealing with a group of people, entrepreneurs, business owners, who employ the majority of people in Jamaica, especially small businesses, why nothing significant for them? Yeah, so, you know, the truth is, Kalila, we have to sort, certainly rotate, yeah? And, and you'll see in this budget, we provided benefits for large segments of the population, which is important, right? Because people, you know, have to see that the, these reforms are working for them. We'd have started government providing benefits on the business side, and those worked out well because we saw the dramatic improvement in, certainly in construction and in other sectors, tourism and BPO and so forth. Um, having said that, there's a lot of government programs directed towards business. Today, uh, we have, I believe, if you were to add it all up, the number is close to $10 billion of private equity, venture capital financing that has been catalyzed by government contributions, right? So the government has co-sponsored or, or sponsored several of these funds, which have had the have, we have done it on the basis that they go out and raise additional funds. And I believe if you add it up, certainly it's it's closer to 10 billion than it is to five uh, in terms of equity financing that's available. We also, I didn't speak about it, but we do have, you know, World Bank and IBD, uh, IDB financing uh, through the Development Bank of Jamaica that continues, um, if I'm not mistaken. So we, we have existing programs continuing, but I agree that um, with the uh, 
with a, one or two possible exceptions, you know, we wouldn't, didn't have anything big headline new. But just, Khalil, just bear in mind that, you know, it's a big country and in any one budget, uh, reaching every single group is challenging and we have to make choices uh, year to year. And I would say that we have, you know, had huge support for the business community um, over the period of this administration. And that is going to continue. So next time. Yes. Yes. Oh, we, we, did, we did reduce the corporate income tax rate for independent oh. power producers. I mean, I know you are not one, but um, we did, you know. That's it, what, that's like four to five businesses out of thousands. They're important businesses. They they produce energy on a renewable basis and we want them to, to continue and to grow. And we have a huge uh, RFP that is out for, what is it? Is it 200 megawatts or thereabouts? And we want to incentivize to get the to get good bids at low prices. So reduce the tax rate there. But I agree in general that, um, you know, this, this year, uh, the budget definitely played more of a focus to the, 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 you know, working people in Jamaica who are critically important, Kalila, to keep the system going. Is that and, because the election is coming up? I mean, election is not constitutionally due until September of 2025. But you would have seen, if you examined our policies over the past few years, that there is a, a rotation, right? That we, we are, we are principled and deliberate about sharing the gains of economic recovery and economic stability with all segments of the Jamaican society. It doesn't come all at the same time. Public sector employees would have gone through 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, looking at the rest of Jamaica and the stuff that we're doing there. Yeah, but their time came in 2022, 2023, and 2024. And they got $200 billion in additional allocation for public sector compensation. So I'm saying that to say that it's not possible to do all things for everybody at the same time in the same year. But I think if you examine our record from 2016, you'll see that we are fair and that over that time period, all demographic groups have been able to benefit from the advances that we're making in economic stability and in sustainable and in the fruits of sustainable policies. I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening, Minister Clark. Hope you get some rest now. Yeah, bye. I, I definitely need it. Thank you, Kalila.